We're going to move on now to Sarah Thirstfield. Sarah uh, very kindly came in at the last minute um, where we had a cancellation, so we're very grateful to her. And she's going to talk, unless she's changed her mind because you're so relaxed about it, textiles in underwear. Is that right, Sarah? Uh, more or less. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. More or less. Um, as you see, there's a certain amount of underwear involved. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad Anne said I came in at the last minute because I have not recorded anything. As you see, this is live from my sewing room on the Welsh border with wind howling outside. And I'm absolutely terrified, frankly. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how long it's going to take and we haven't started when I thought we were going to. Anyway, um, there's nobody behind the camera, it's just standing there. I've said to Anne, if I go on too long or if there are questions and she's got to shout to me because my screen's over there, uh, but the camera's up here and the things I want to talk about are here. Uh, so it may be a little bit chaotic, for which I apologise. Um, can you hear me all right? Is the sound okay? Absolutely fine. Yeah, we're fine, Sarah. Right. Because I have actually, I took delivery uh, by courier of a nice big flashing new microphone about two hours ago. And on a normal Saturday, technical support would have come rushing in and opened the box and helped me set it up. On this Saturday, Technical support is too busy watching England do very badly. In the rug. I don't know how the rugby is going, but it doesn't sound good. If, there, if you hear howling, oh, we've lost. Uh, so he hasn't come and set up the microphone because he's watching rugby. Uh, and so I was hoping that the sound on the camera would be okay. Uh, so as I say, if Anne can tell me when I've gone on long enough and tell me to shut up and she can tell me if there's any questions, then I'll just wind myself up and let myself go. Right, um, I don't know whether you can see, I've got the Good Wives banner, which we normally appear under at the market. Uh, Ruth is not here this time. I don't know if she's watching in the distance or still at home weaving Mercado, which is her current project. So it's, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about being Sarah Thurstil, and more of the point about making stuff out of linen, which is what I do. I make clothes. I like making clothes, I like finding out about making clothes and learning, and I like showing other people, helping them to learn. Um, and it's lovely to have seen this afternoon that I'm not alone in that. We've seen some really beautiful videos on how to do things. So we traders, we're not just about trying to hang on to the work ourselves. We want to help you do it too. Uh, so if you don't know how to keep your own points, and so your own eyelids by now, um, then you haven't been paying attention. And I'm going to tell you how to cut out your own smocks in a minute. Um, so yeah, I like teaching people about clothes. I don't have a favourite period because what interests me is how things evolve over very long periods of time and why they stay the same for a long time, like shirts, and why they then change. Um, and as I say, I don't have a favourite period, but I do describe anything less than 500 years ago as recent, which does give you some sense of my perspective on things. Um, just to get the shameless plugs in, uh, this has gone out of print. It sold so many copies that it hasn't been available for the past year, but I'm told by the publishers that it's being reprinted, it'll be available in April, so you can get it direct from the publisher's website www.crowwood.com and then you don't have to go near Amazon and if we do get an actual physical fair Paul Meekins will no doubt have his usual box full of them and you can get it from him. You can also contact me if you've got questions about it you say well I made that pattern and it didn't fit me what have I done wrong I will do a zoom session and we can talk about it. But uh, the other thing I'm going to do a shameless plug for is um, a best-selling pamphlet, which you can get from my website called Perfect Linens, because one of the things I'm really interested in is linen underwear. And this you may well find, if I don't explain properly, that you want one of those at the end. You've got two kinds of clothes. You've got tailors making lovely outerwear and you've got linen centuries making 
your body linens and it's a lower status of clothing. What the, um, what the centuries do is anything that we need out of linen. They made sh um, sheets, towels, napkins, tablecloths. And when you look through inventories and lists, then those are where your body linens are found. They're not in the wardrobe with the nice stuff. They're down with all the rest of the washable linen goods. Uh, <laughs> and they don't check all that much. And ideally, we all want our medieval underclothing to be made out of linen. But I have long said I'd rather see good cotton or even good blends. There are some cotton rail linen mixes than I would see bad linen. And there is these days some very, very bad linen around. I don't know whether you can see, but you can almost see daylight through that. It's not particularly nice. It's very soft. Um, yeah, it's pure linen, but if you make a shirt or a shift out of that, it won't actually last very long. And you may find when you walk out of your tent on a fine summer's morning that everybody can see straight through it. So do try and find heavier qualities of linen. Ideally, see if you can find vintage linen. Now you saw how this stuff just screws up like a dish rag. I don't know whether you can hear that. This is a bit of possibly 19th century shirting. And look at the way it's crumpled. Look at the density of the weave. And this is an excitement of my look at the proper selvage down the side. That is what you really like to find if you want to make high status underwear. But it's very difficult. You go around an awful lot of antique markets feeling an awful lot of rubbish to find the odd length like this. But it, never give up. And if someone offers you a linen sheet, take it because it may be useful. There is some pretty good linen available from various specialist merchants, but start with our own lovely specialist merchants Parts Fabrics, Anwar Ali, he's trading online if you can't get to a fair. And the last time I got in touch with him and said, I want some good, plain, working gray, shirting linen. Uh, he said, well, I've got some loom state. Now, if you're offered loom state, it looks quite hard and shiny and it looks a bit holy. It doesn't feel like something you want to wear. But you notice that's a genuine Arts Fabrics label saying this is the best and I bought all eight meters <laughs> so he will have more like that but if it's called loom state that means what it says it's come off the loom it's still full of the gum they put on the thread when they weave it and I divided the eight meters in two and the other half has been through a ferocious hot wash and it now looks like that. It shrunk quite a bit, but it's closed up, it's softened. That is actually lighter in weight than the ship I'm wearing at the moment, which is pretty heavy stuff. You might think, hmm, do I want to wake my underwear out of something like that? But yes, believe me, you do. It will wear much longer. If you put a lot of work into it, then it'll be um, much better. It's, it's more worth putting the work into good linen than into the sort of thin, flimsy stuff. <clears throat> um, of course, modern linen is all woven very wide. Traditionally, historically, linen was woven in different widths, and you tend to find it woven in yard wide or L wide, or sometimes narrower. And the way things were cut out depended on that. Um, I've noticed in the course of the day that there are various approaches to measurement. I recommend a tape measure which has both inches and centimeters because we have people who work and think in both. But if you're a seamstress, you didn't use either. You didn't bother about inches. You worked with the yardstick. So you've got a yard, you've got a half a yard, a quarter of a yard, half a quarter, and a nail. And if you've got a length of linen and you know how wide it is, 
then actually you don't need either of those. You can simply do it by folding and dividing it up. And if you know you've got the right width, it doesn't even matter how wide it is. If you know it's the right width to make you a shift or a shirt, then you just go for it and use it um, because it's all done by proportion. Uh, where have I got to? <laughs> right. Now, cutting out linens, cutting out shirts and smocks or shifts, same thing, different word at different times. It's very simple. But it's simple if you understand where they're coming from. It's not just about using every last bit of the linen because it's precious, although that is true of cloth right up until it starts being made by machine. But it's also because if you go back to when people first started taking a length of cloth and folding it, cutting it, and making it into a garment, they hadn't got any mental idea of a pattern. They got the cloth and they adapted that. So everything about the way centuries have worked is simply based on using the cloth. It only needs to fit where it touches. If it's big enough to go around you, that's all you need. If it's long enough, as my granny used to say, to cover your requirements, that's all you need. <laughs> so uh, you don't have to worry too much about the measurement. Now, I've got everything in order. And of course, if you've got a piece of linen and you want to make it into a garment, then what everybody thinks of as the obvious and logical thing to do is simply to fold it over the shoulder, straight width of stuff, and then take two more bits of the straight width of stuff to make the sleeves and make a straight up and down shirt like that. And yep, yeah, that's one of the simple ways to do it. And men's shirts, we don't know when they start being made like that. We do know they go on being made by methods which are based on rectangles right through into the second half of the 19th century. If you saw Elgar shirts earlier on, they were showing their 18th century shirts, which Okay, they've got gathered sleeves, they're gathered into collars and so on, but they're still basically made up of a bunch of rectangles. You don't need a pattern as such. Uh, so it's a system that worked and carried on working and eventually changed, basically because of cheap cotton and sewing machines. Uh, so I describe this as the thousand year shirt because you could really wear this pretty much any time and it will serve all right. Uh, oh, and <laughs> when you cut it out, this one has a small neck hole with a slip to it. But if you're really being mean and economical, if you cut a larger oval neck hole, then you can get the underarm gussets out of the neck hole and you don't have any little bits left over at all. You can use the whole lot and have nothing to throw away. But, Straight up and down doesn't work for women. We're narrower across the shoulders on the whole, and because we wear our shifts longer, we yeah, we need them wider at the hem. Oh yes. <clears throat> Diagram of cutting out a simple shirt from a narrow piece of linen. Um, another diagram of cutting a smaller shirt from a wider piece of linen. That is all the pattern you need. <laughs> now, where was I? Yes, this, this, this really simple idea of just taking your length of stuff is all very well if you're large, but if you're making something for a woman, shift the longer. And to say, typically women tend to be narrower across the shoulders and need the thing wider at the hem. So what do you do about that? Well, I don't know how early on they started on the simple method of taking the bore off one side to do it, because we really have precious few survivals, and there are a lot fewer pictures of women in their underwear than there are of men in shirts. So it's very difficult to say for certain, but 
why wouldn't we surprise that the method I'm going to show you goes back to the fifth century? It was, I'm pretty sure, in the 10th century, and it was certainly still being used in the 18th century. And yeah, there are fancier versions of the, the swap which have high gathered necks and full sleeves and so on. But this basic form carries on for a very long time because this one is a conjecture, but this is actually made from the cutting instructions, some of the first linen cutting instructions that were ever written down and published in 1789. And as you see, it's exactly the same shape. The only difference is it's got short sleeves now. We started being allowed to show our elbows somewhere in the 18th century. Well, I'm sure there are some men who can show about it. Um, now, what has happened with this, the reason it's narrower at the shoulders and wider at the end, is that if you think of the same width of linen that the bloke's shirt was made from, at the bottom there, and you fold it over the shoulders just the same, then you measure in and you take a long piece off that side and you turn it over and you sew it on this side. And if that isn't quite making sense, here's a layout I prepared earlier. This, this is that piece of very nice linen I mentioned. What about, I found about 11 meters of it on a, an antique store. And I've made a couple of my favorite customers shirts out of it. But to be quite honest, it's one of those pieces of cloth where it's so nice, you're actually afraid to cut it. You don't want to make it into anything because you might get it wrong or it might go to someone who didn't appreciate it properly. Uh, so as you can see, it's been folded up and put away with the other bits of linen for rather a long time. But here it is, and I'm just going, I've just laid out of it how to plan one of those very simple shifts. And as you can see, it's quite a, it's, it's less than a yard wide because the table is a yard wide. So it's, I think it was about 29, 30 inches. It's more than three quarters of a yard, which is a good place. But anyway, there it is. And I've just taken it as the size I'm going to bring this way from. Um, what you need for a shift is to make sure that the shoulders, the width across the shoulders, is at least half of your bust size. And then the rest will follow on. <laughs> so we'll take it that it is. And all I've done for length, the length I mentioned in this business of different ways of measuring, typical length for women's shifts is an L sterling. An L is five quarters of a yard. So there's a yard and one more quarter. Um, and that comes well down below the knees on most of it. If you want a longer one, you could make it a yard and a half. It's up to you. But you double the length that you want. And then what I've done is simply folded it into three to find the thirds. And two thirds is being used for the shoulders. And then this third, I've creased it down to the hem. You can see, you can actually see the crease because the linen is that good, but I've marked it with pins to make it a little bit clearer. And if I were going for this, then I would simply cut down that line through the two layers and then cut through the fold here. And then I've got two long, narrow triangular doors turn them over here and over sew the self piece of cloth on here and there we are that's the body of the ship um, and cut out the neck hole deeper at the front shallower at the back and hem that and get the gussets out of the piece of the neck and then I've also demonstrated with another half a yard because that's two and a half yards there and then with another half yard, I've just 
found a pair of tapered sleeves, Ephesian shaped sleeves, which somebody else mentioned earlier on. And again, I simply folded it in three. So two thirds forms the shoulder end of one sleeve. And then you find the middle of that and make the same distance as that there across here uh, and mark a line. So when you cut that out, you've got one complete stitch, and again, you've got one little crack in the door, and it comes over here, and this forms another complete sleeve. And that's it. Well, that's it if you've got a piece of linen the right width. What do you do if you haven't? What are the other ways of going about this? What do you do if you're bigger than that? Well, as I said, the basic measurement you need is to have it at least half your bust size across the shoulders, and then as it flares out, it will be big enough for you. Um, and if you've got wider linen, that's what you can do with the modern widths of linen. If you're small and scrawny like me, then you can get two bodies, you can get clever. So here's one with fold, planned, there, there's the shoulder width, and then you measure from here to here, and um, it's, it, you, you have to draw yourself a diagram and work it out. It doesn't have to be a measured diagram, but just figure out your, your sizes from a center line there. But you plan one body complete like that, and then you've got a little pair of doors there. And then the other body you make in two pieces. So you're going to have shoulder, seams over the shoulders, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't have to have a hole if you can cut one out of another, as they call it. And then if you're really skinny, you can get the sleeves up the side. And so you can get two shifts out of the two and a half meters of linen or so that you would buy if you were only making one. If you're larger, what do you do? Well, I don't have any evidence for shift with any sort of fixed neckline. But as I said, we don't have very much evidence about shifts anyway, so that isn't much to go on. And what I recommend for women who are a bit better endowed than me, if you're up over 100 centimeters, 40 inch bust or more, then what you'll find is if you take your half your bust measurement, you're going to have something that's rather wide over the shoulders. So cut that neckline bigger, make the shoulders the same sort of length, but make a bigger, wider neck hole, and then cut a narrow strip of linen and just pleat the fullness into the neckline. It may not be authentic, but since your sheet is not meant to show under your outer clothing anyway, that doesn't matter. Make the band the right length to match the neckline of your kirtle, whatever and pleat it all in and nobody will be any the wiser and you will be comfortable and won't be falling out the neck of the ship, which is no fun as well. And if you are larger like that, then, um, sorry, I had a scaling problem when I printed this off this morning, but you may be able to get the idea that from, if, if you're making a very wide ship, you can still get the two bodies side by side, cut out of each other from a single length of linen, so you don't have to buy very much to make yourself a ship. There are a number of ways of doing it. You can plan them to suit yourself by, uh, by drawing it, working out the measurements you need, and then just do yourself a sketch drawing of how it's going to fit onto the block and work out how many you can fit, because it's usually more economical to buy enough linen for two or three at a time and cut them all out at once. And then you've always got something to sew when you're at an event or when you're sitting at home and going, what on earth can I do with this evening? Um, shall I go on? Uh, we're, we're, we're all over the place on time, aren't we? I can start demonstrating stitches if you like. <laughs> Is anybody there? Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, carry Hello, on. Sarah. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Carry on, Sarah. You're doing all right. <laughs> yeah. 
we might we all might be better dressed next season now. <laughs> Good. I'll I'll tell you. I'll I'll give you a push. Okay. Okay. I hoped you would. Actually, I hoped you'd say that'll do. I've got someone else now. But I think. Oh I no no! Carry go. on. We're not okay, letting you off that easy. Right. <laughs> Seems then we'll have to start talking about sewing them together because I mentioned over sewing selvages, and that of course is the ideal. This is a couple of little scraps of that nice stuff. And if you have got real salvages, that I did set myself up with a needle full of thread, um, make the banana. My son didn't do a lot of sewing when he was a kid, but he decided that making a banana pink cushion was a fun thing to do. And I had to make myself another because it was really used to shape. So uh, there we go. Anyway, if you have real selvages, then the classic sensitivity scene is over sewing. And you hold, you should, of course, for a long seam, you'd be pinning it and keeping it ready, but I'm just doing a little demo. So I'm holding the edges together and you bring, you do it towards yourself. Your first stitch comes through the nearer one. You could, if you're beginning, if you're a bit nervous, you could tie a knot in that thread so you can lay it in. But all the handbooks say, just lie the end in, make the first couple of stitches, don't pull too hard. And then you catch the end into it. And after a couple of stitches, you see it won't pull out. I am like Jackie Phillips, I use my thumbnail to hold it all in place. And every now and again, you miscalculate and the needle goes under the thumbnail and not over it. It's a badge of honor. <laughs> but what you're aiming to do is put the needle a couple of threads down from the edge of the fabric. And then you move a couple of threads along. I've got an early 19th century linen shirt, one of the few original pieces I own. And the seam on that, the side seams, they've actually oversewn so close that it's almost like a solid sort of rib of stitching down the side of the shirt. It's a lovely garment. I didn't patch it up because I was only thinking about medieval ones. But that's that's over sewing, and that is how you join any couple of edges together that are straight and simple. And if you don't have selvages, of course, you can over sew folded edges. And that is how you make a sew and fell seam. And these, I'm hoping these will show up because this is a set of samples that I use for explaining the basic linen seams. And I've done them in different colored threads. And the reason for that is partly that the red thread is the first stitching you do. So if you are over sewing, this is disconcerting to people who are used to machine sewing, but you over sew on the right side, you do it on the outside of the garment. And if what you're doing is over sewing two folded edges together, then you don't just make a sewn seam, you make a sew and fell. So when you've done the over sewing on the outside, you then press the edges on the inside, trim one down, fold the other one over it, and then you fell, hem, that fold down on the inside. And it's a really good, strong seam. The point about seams on linens is they're always made. So the whole thing lies flat and there are no edges to fray. And it's partly for comfort, but it's mainly because these things are made to be washed and you don't want them to fray away. You want these seams to last for ages. And if it looks a bit laborious, just think you bought that nice linen that is good and solid and is going to stand years of washing, you might as well put the work into it. Um, there is a quicker one, and I tend to use this on the side seams, the long seams of ships, and that is a run and fell seam where on the inside, you first do running stitch or do a little back stitch every now and again. You shouldn't need to do back stitch all the way. 
that's probably overdoing it, but you run it and flatten all the turnings. And again, cut back one, fold down the other, and then fell it. The second was a stitching. And those are the classic seams that Sam's Christmas yields. And then of course the felling or hemming you do on all the raw, all the edges, the ends of the sleeves, the neck hole, the hem. Notice they're very narrow. You don't waste fabric on deep seam allowances. And it's one of the things that makes them look right without anyone really knowing why. Um, it's something I look out for if, if, because it means you need to cut the edges very precise. Your straight lines want to be as close to a thread as you can get them. And your diagonal lines, you need to cut good and precise as well. Because half the secret of making a good hem is starting with a good edge. Uh, just out of interest, the other seams I've got on here, there's a thing called a counter hem, where you turn in the two edges over each other and each one, that one's hemmed on that side, and that one's hemmed on that side. Um, now, there's a thing that a lot of people are now very keen on, and they think they need to use it, and that is a French seam. And a French seam is when you first do the seam on the outside of the garment, you just run the edges together, and then you turn it to the inside, and you run it again to enclose all seam allowances and you've got a seam that sticks up. Well, this, this is where my sort of stitch counting obsession with technique comes in and I say, that's really a 20th century dressmaking thing. It goes with washing frocks um, and it's not proper plain sewing. It's uh, venturing off into something else. And then the quickest you can do is telling me called a mantua maker seam. And you simply fold all the edges over and fell them down. So that is finishing off the edges and holding the seam together. And it is very quick, but again, it leaves your rib sticking up. And it's, um, it's probably not as solid and as durable. And it would certainly be called scamp work by the 19th century writers on the subject. Ideally, you would use linen thread for linen. If you're starting out or if you're just going to be doing it at home, then there's nothing wrong with using piece of cotton thread. It's slightly less bother, it's easier to get hold of. But if you want to get them right, then my preferred is Bockham's Lace Maker's thread. It comes in a range of weights, so you can get the right weight for the kind of linen you're sewing. Uh, and does, of course, need waxing. Excuse um, me, Sarah. Yeah. Um, couple of three minutes now, um, okay, well, if you don't mind. Thank you yeah, so much for doing fine. it. I can stop any time. Are there any questions? A couple of three minutes. Yeah. I say, are there any questions? Anyone come in or are they all just going away and having dinner instead? <laughs> OK, well, then, if I've got a couple of three minutes, I will just finish off by saying we don't, as I said, know very much going back into the early periods. We know there were professional censuses, but they didn't like the tailors. They didn't write anything down. We don't know exactly what they did. We've only got fragments of what they made. But if you want to learn about classic plain sewing, or if you want to make shirts from later periods, well, you can start by buying my booklet, as I mentioned, but you can also look at for the likes of this. Because when uh, we started on compulsory education in the 19th century, then needlework was taught as a matter of course. And there are various books by no doubt formidable women. Uh, I think my personal favorite is Emily Jones, Needlework and Cut Aloud. But uh, Elizabeth Rosevere tells you needlework, knitting and cutting out. And the great thing about these is you've got this tradition of needlework handed down by women over hundreds of years. And the women who wrote these 
had learned from their grandmothers, they were still channeling that tradition. They were the generation before the sewing machine just wiped out their needlework. So they really are worth looking out for. They're probably not very expensive and you'll learn things you never even thought of about um, sewing and about centers. And that's probably a good place to start because I owe a lot to them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm sure that, you know, at the end of the day, we'll all know how to make a shift now. <laughs>